inspire, connect, resource, growing healthy churches, is in relationship for God's mission. Wonderful lots of questions there. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm pleased to see that I wasn't the only one. I saw from the chat that cried during that story that Rachel shared at the end. So, <laughs> um, so we've got some time for some Q&A. We probably won't be able to get through all of the questions, but we will kind of do our best. Um, there was something, Rachel, that I sort of saw people commenting on and people sort of say that kind of youth attracts youth. And um, so if you haven't got any to start with, where do you kind of start with that? And it might kind of link into something which somebody said about how do we do outreach with um, young people? Yeah, youth do attract youth, absolutely. Um, but we can make youth visible even if they're not in our building. So one of the first things we can do is regularly be praying for young people, have images up on our screens about young people, become really knowledgeable about the young people in our area. So even if they're not physically in the building, we can be a church that communicates that our culture is when young people come, they are welcome and we're here for them. There are three very basic model strategies for youth ministry build up, build in and build out. And most churches without realizing it tend to skew towards one of those. So if you have no young people at all, um, what you can adopt is a build in, build up method if you have children. So if you have some children in your church, you think, well, we haven't got any teenagers, but these children will become teenagers. So let's begin our youth ministry uh, in partnership with the children's work and let's start youth ministry aged nine or 10. Now I'm not saying you would do with them what you would do with 15 year olds, but you say we begin to train up volunteers now to be youth workers because youth ministry and children's ministry has synergy, but it is different. So build up and pour all your energies there. Build in is perfect if you don't really have any young people, but you have a bus stop near your church where young people gather, or you have a school, or you have a sports club, and you think, where are young people? And could we be doing work reaching them and building them into the life of the church? So it looks like detached youth ministry, it looks like a school's work team. And then build out is, we have a few young people in our church. Remember, three or four teenagers sat dotted around the church don't automatically see themselves as a tribe. You need to help them get to know each other. They don't automatically connect just because they're the same age group. But building with them, so it's getting them into a set of like, this is your group. We're going to respond to the three of you as if you were 30 of you. We're going to have lunches for you, take on weekends away, lots of activities. And the build out is we want you to invite your friends. So you have the courage to go out and invite your friends. So I would say to you, if, if you're thinking we don't really have many young people, ask yourselves, what of those three models build up? build in from outside or build out, which would be the best place to pour your energies? Very briefly, that's, I'm gonna keep these really short. <laughs> no, that was brilliant, that's really great, thank you. Um, so, totally other topic now, <laughs> but somebody else commented around um, the mental health um, concerns that we have around young people. And I think we've become much more aware of that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, have you got any kind of thoughts or reflections in terms of how the church might respond to that in terms of that should they become that a safe space in which you can talk about mental health and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and interestingly, the government's talking more about social prescribers. So if someone goes to the doctor, they, they, they could get a medical prescription, but increasingly um, these sort of primary care trusts are recognizing that lots of young people and lots of adults are coming and what they need is social prescribing. They need to be referred somewhere where what they get is a listening therapy or a support group. So it's, it's things that if they don't happen, it might be that this individual will need medical intervention and clinical support. But right now what they need is community contact safe adults so I think um, we are not I am not a, um, an expert in young people's mental health but as a youth worker I'm trained and resourced around knowing how to signpost young people to further services also recognizing that the threshold at which young people need to reach to actually access clinical support is very high so actually we as church there's an increasing number of young people who need some mental health emotional well-being emotional resilience resilient support that we can provide. Now, I think when we think about mental health, we tend, I sometimes my mind jumps to diagnosable mental health conditions. What actually I'm talking about when I talk about mental health is um, resilience building. 
um, helping young people understand emotional well-being. One of the problems is for young people is that growing up in a world where they know about mental health more now, what they can do is they can feel anxious and think, oh, I've got an anxiety disorder. Um, I'm somebody that still, I, I get panic attacks actually. If, I, if I'm very anxious, I can, I can feel myself going there. And I think I, I sometimes go, oh my goodness, I'm going to have a panic attack. My, you know, and, and I'm 44 years old and I struggle with overwhelming emotions and anxiety. So how much more for young people who are facing anxiety? So I think we, we, what we could be doing is helping young people understand their emotions and understand tools to deal with their emotions and also understand what it means to bring your emotions to Jesus and um, how so I never pray for young people God take away their anxiety I will pray in the midst of their anxiety help them to know that you are with them so actually I think it's also it's a theological thing understanding the place of our emotions anxiety can be really helpful actually but it's when it overwhelms us and sends us into ruminating and like that. that's the problem so i think groups like mind and soul foundation can be very helpful in this um at youthscape we have a mental health and emotional well-being team who innovate resources for young people around this so i think look get get glean some stuff but i think we do need to be operating in this space but i would say not at the high levels i would say in this middle threshold group yeah now i just want to stay with that because i'm i'm really um I think the church has got so much to say about it and they think it's got to be high level so therefore yeah. don't do anything because they panic yeah. but I think we've got really important like you talk about contemplative prayer we've got yeah. such gifts that we could offer young people so I just really want to encourage people to sort of don't yeah. shy away from it you've got yeah. some beautiful gifts that you can offer the young people I'm um, in your community um, schools and everything so yeah so it's exciting well, it's not exciting, obviously, but it's exciting that we have a, we have a voice. <laughs> um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so this is just a bit like a, a major question and answer, question and answer, but I just kind of want to get all your wisdom as much oh, well, as you can. Do it. Yeah, let's do it. Well done, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, another question that somebody asked, and I kind of really noticed this, there's been some beautiful intergenerational involvement during lockdown with children and young people being involved um, in services where the pressure's off a little bit, they're not having to be up front and all that kind of thing. So there's a real, some beautiful sort of um, pictures of belonging. How can we encourage that rather than just go straight back to how things were when everyone's put into their different groups? Yeah, I mean, I... I know that everybody listening, you're so creative. I, and I, I realize that there's no easy answers. I think actually you probably already know the answer for your context. What we're going to do at Preston Minster, I'm so glad about this, is because of social distancing, we're going to get rid of rows of chairs and we're going to do in all of our services, what Jason and I do on a Sunday night at seven, six o'clock, is we're going to have sofas and bunches of chairs because we're not going to sit people in rows where they're close together for social distancing. So actually, it's a real opportunity to change the look and the layout of your building, which will lend itself a lot more to these natural conversations. There's nothing more damaging to relationships than rows of chairs. Because you can't get to anybody. You sit in the same place. The moment you have sofas and bunches of chairs and good refreshments, like put a bit of decent money behind good croissants on a Sunday morning. Get a team early on a Sunday to cook bacon butties. Get some teenagers and some adults arriving at church earlier to cook bacon butties for everyone. So I think if, if, if actually a really good treasure in lockdown has been this getting people together then then ask them what would you like to carry on doing together um, and it, and I think catering and food is a brilliant way to do it I think people have missed each other haven't they so I think spending a bit of budget on meals I think is a brilliant idea um, capturing stories of lockdown could you give a great iPad and camera to a few people in your church and say as lockdown eases could you go around these homes and capture on film what's God been saying to you and, and, and get get your younger people doing that with some of your older people who are great at tech you know be, get, capture stories of lockdown that you're going to sort of share and create content and so I think I, I would say you are very busy but give yourself a morning where you just go and sit in a park bench somewhere else and just say what would I love to do? What sorts of things would I love to do, see our church doing? And, and, and try some of them and, and get them going and, and telling stories, having young people interviewing adults as well. You know, give, give voice to young people in this space. It's a great opportunity. It's great. Yeah, yeah. 
it's um we always sometimes people struggle don't they to do how do you bring about change within church and we've just been given this this moment in time where actually we can maybe make changes more easily yes. um brilliant thank you um could you comment on the whole thing around like entertainment versus the actual engagement of young people and we know that consumerism we've yeah. kind of the church has sometimes sold out to that a little bit so what, that sort of tension yeah I mean empty entertainment we all know when we're doing it and it sucks and young people hate it they um but equally on the other side young people are visual they love things to be fast moving and fast paced and one thing that I've discovered through lockdown is our young people aged 15 plus they seem to really enjoy the discussions over zoom they they will they will literally be able to sit still for longer when you're 15 you can but the 11 to 14 year olds they just want to do stuff and 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 so our youth work with them is like kicking a football around and going to the beach and um, and that's not entertainment that is responding to the fact that when they're 11 to 14 the way god's wired them is to be very physical and it's beautiful so i think let's absolutely not play the entertainment game like it's got to be super cool for them to rock up that's a complete lie from the pit of hell but equally let's not say the opposite of entertainment is sit still big bible discussions the more serious it is the more real it is because actually young people sat around a bonfire having massive discussions and a big old giggle about faith can be massively faith forming. So I think it's more actually about the motivation of the leader than actually about the end product. The end product can be as shiny and as fantastic as you like, as long as the heart of it is these young people growing their faith. Um, and, 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 and as with all things, the best things for teenagers are the things that you never plan for, aren't they? They are having five kids in the car and the car breaks down. And then you spend three hours on the side of the motorway with young people. I mean, that, that, is the, that is the memorable moment. So I think it's about creating memorable moments with young people. Those are the moments where they change. So I would say, please don't resist things being professional and good just because you don't want to entertain them. You know, and I think somebody very bravely said on their question, they said, um, it's been hard to engage young people in the general services of the church. Um, I, I think ask big questions about that. Is it because they are zoomed out? They are, they, are, they are digitally burned out. They're having to do schooling online. They're having to chat to their friends online and suddenly adults telling them to jump back online and it's just too much for them. Or is it because actually their expectations of stuff online is a certain quality and if they're not seeing that, it just doesn't care. So I think, and I'm not saying that to be critical because I, you know, it was more just to ask the questions. Let, let's, let's ask them. That's interesting you didn't connect. Can I just ask why? So yeah, let's avoid entertainment, but let's not think that any kind of professionalism is automatically shallow. No, let's, yeah. That's right, thank you. And just to sort of say, we've just been writing some guidelines um, around with like children and young people and coming back to church and what, that looks like when we can meet face to face all that kind of stuff and one of the things we can say is ask them what they're wanting when you talk about consulting the whole church include the voice of children and young people in that so don't just be adult centric in your thinking but keep on asking the young people they've got some really and young children they've got valuable things that we be hearing so again it's an opportunity for us to kind of change our practice a little bit if you're not already doing it and yeah. bring the voice of the children and young people in Great. Now, this I've shorthanded this one. I'm sorry, whoever who uh, I think it was David that asked the question. But how good a Christian do we have to be? They have to be before they can become a leader, kind of thing, in terms of their discipleship and that kind of <laughs> and things like that. Oh my goodness! I mean, I think Jesus' disciples were horrendous Christians, weren't they? <laughs> um, uh, I think I think it's it's a very important question but I don't think it's a static answer. So I, I think, again, this is a super short answer. So you guys are wise, you know, you know more than I do about this. You've been doing it for ages. Um, I think it's what direction they're moving in. If I have a young person that I think, at the moment, I'm not seeing much Christian maturity in your life, but I actually know that you're moving in the direction of Christian maturity, then I will match your, I'll, I'll give you leadership opportunities, serving opportunities first, actually. 
I will give you in a way that matches up because I want you to, I don't want you to think there's a certain point at which then you're given, you're allowed to, to be a leader. No, actually I want these along the way. But if I have a young person who is resisting to growing, even if actually at the moment they're praying out loud, they've been through Alpha, they've got Christian family, but actually they're resisting growth. But at the moment they take another static, they look like they're following Jesus. I'm, I'm going to give them less. I'm, you know, so I think, it, I think it's about the direction they're traveling in. Jason and I, on a Sunday night at six o'clock on Preston Minster Instagram, we are doing our six o'clock service for emerging adults. And we've started something called hashtag the 60 second sermon. And every Sunday night, we have a different one of our young adults aged 18 to 30s will prepare and give their 60 second sermon. I'm not sure that the last two I would necessarily know if they are fully following Jesus. In fact, I've asked them that. I've said, I love you to do the 60 second sermon. I realize this is a journey for you. Would you be up for finding a Bible verse, asking God to speak to you and preaching on it? Both of them have said yes. And both of them have said, yes, I'm not sure I'm a Christian yet though. And I'm like, that's cool. Just, and, and I think because I've asked them to do it, I've then walked with them prayed with them, asked God's Holy Spirit to reveal them, asked, asked them what they think God's saying to them. And it's really interesting because for both of them, that experience has drawn them close to Jesus. I'm not asking them to baptize somebody. I'm not asking them to preach a 40 second, 40 minute sermon. I'm asking them to do 60 seconds on what God has said to them through a Bible verse, knowing that God will speak to them. So I think it's, it's about matching taking risks in discipling this generation but never making them like they're about to fall you know this is we've put them in the limelight and they're, they're now about they're about to fall that would be horrendous but I think let's take some risks you know what direction are they moving in? I also think that many young adults and young people don't become Christians because nobody asks them and I think actually we could get bolder at saying do you want to follow Jesus I know last week you said no, but this week, do you want to follow Jesus? And, I, and when we first planted the Minster, Jason and I on a Sunday night at five to six would get outside the front of the Minster, stand on the high street where everyone's queuing up for pubs and clubs. And we'd say to them, we've got a church service happening in there. Do you want to come and check it out? Come and get a donut. You can disappear again then. You, and they'd say to us, these young adults would say, oh, am I, am I allowed in your church? And we're like, yeah, of course you are. This is for you. And so we said to our congregation, when people walk in to have a look, don't turn and moan and frown and get like, oh, why are they? We're here for them. We want them to come and give Jesus a go. Come and check it out. So I think we need to get bolder at inviting. Someone's put bolder street evangelism. Yes, I agree. Bolder inviting people to follow Jesus. Um, and if that helps, I, I think it's very contextual and it's about relationship. I know these young adults. I, I know who I can ask. But yeah. that no. So, well, a, a couple of thoughts pinged in my brain when you were saying that. So the place where you're in now, have you kind of built it up almost from scratch? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So because someone was saying about stories where they've, where kind of change has happened. So could you just tell us a little bit more about some of that journey? Would that be okay? Yeah. So we, we planted, there was about 34 of us that came together to plant this church. And there was about five um, or six people already from Preston who felt God call them out of the church they were in. They chatted with their church leaders. They had the blessing of their church leaders and they joined us. And our focus is absolutely not on sheep stealing. So any lovely Christians from other churches that come and say, oh, we're thinking about coming to Preston Minster. We very kindly say, we love you. Go back and bless your church community. Um, and if your church leadership says actually they're with our blessing then great but we're here for people who don't go to church who don't think church is for them who would never darken the doors of church and because we're right on the high street and mm -hmm. um, we're very visible it's a nightclub end it's the bars it's the cafes we've got the university right there so we've just got really bold about the uh, go and tell so come and listen go and tell so all of our services are come and listen we have a donut wall outside our church with, with ring donuts hanging on them come and grab a donut come and check out what's going on and then we have a go and tell we go onto the university campus we get when we're invited to we go onto the streets and we tell people do you know that something incredible has happened that you can already be free like God's already done what you need in his life. So come and find out about it. So that's, and, and, and we're seeing growth with emerging adults. But there are challenges with that because we don't know really anything about their lives. They'll come from a variety of backgrounds. 
Um, but we are taking the risk that Jesus is big enough to cope with all the stuff that's going on. And that as we help young people love loving Jesus, and as a culture, as we mimic being surrendered in every areas of our lives, our money, our sex lives, our, you know, our finance, our, as we model that, that we're inviting young people, this is what it looks like to say yes to Jesus. So keep moving in this direction. We're walking with you. Somebody asked a question about, you know, what you want to see in young, a young person's sex life before you invite them to be a leader. I, I've, I would say I am, I am conservative in my theology around sexual ethics I'm really pragmatic in my pastoral care and I think what I mean by that is I, I hold a really strong line actually about what I think it means to follow Jesus in terms of my sexual behavior <laughs> that that Jesus puts demands on my sexuality that you know that that's I, I see that in scripture but I also see that actually at the moments where I messed up the most that's where I experienced the grace of Jesus the most um, and I and I crave that for young people. And I so this is what I say: I expect the young people that I disciple to mess up sexually many times. I expect it. I, I don't want it for them. I don't want them to experience the hurt of that. But I expect that will happen. Um, and actually, I also have high expectation that as that happens, that I'll be in their corner fighting for them, and they will know that Jesus is fighting for them, and they will know they can bring that to Jesus and know his grace and restoration and, and pick themselves up and move forward with humility and set new boundaries because of what they've been through. Sexual purity is not the same as sexual virginity and it's not the same as sexual innocence. And, and the trouble is that sometimes we say the moment young people hit the age where they're interested in sex and sexuality and ask questions, that, that, that they're, they're losing it, that, that sexual purity is about like stopping and halting it. Well, no, actually sexual purity is about helping them know that the, the spirit makes them strong and free and they can set boundaries that are countercultural and they can live a different radical way. And when they mess up and when it all goes horribly wrong, Jesus picks them up and, and with humility they begin again. And maybe they do step down from that or from this or they're challenged on that, on the this, but they see the adults around them challenged by that too. The challenge, the adults aren't fixed and youth, young people are not fixed. We're all, we're all messed up and need Jesus. I could talk forever about this because I share, I share the heart of the people listening to this. Yeah. But I think we need to be pragmatic in our discipleship, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I, I've heard you speak on it before and it's, it's, I just love that uh, a more conservative voice, which has a, a, a much more... I suppose that, uh, yeah, yeah, you said a pragmatic. Well, generous orthodoxy, I think, would be a phrase that I would use, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great, it's wonderful. Um, somebody commented about detached work, and I've kind of known in our area, and that actually young people aren't hanging out as much as they once were. I, I used to do detached work, and so they're just not on the street corners and in the parks and all that kind no, of thing. it's so annoying, isn't it? <laughs> I know, I used to love the, the thing of approaching these unknown young people, and how are they going to respond? And um, yeah, so that's kind of something that's um on hold until maybe times change again so obviously they're found online or they're found and that's not the safest place for youth work always to be happening obviously and um and in school so could you what would your reflections and comments be around then reaching out and also we're noticing that youth clubs there's some which are really thriving but they're generally on the decline Yes, they are. I mean, gathered youth work is absolutely on the decline. I think it won't be long for the only people to be doing gathered youth work to be sort of uniformed youth organisations like the Scouts, which is so popular, it's unbelievable, um, and, and faith-based, church-based stuff. So I think there will always be a place for gathering young people. But I do think working in partnership with schools, pupil referral units, further education, um, and then who el whoever else in our community is reaching young people is so important. One of the big phrases that's come out of COVID-19 is we used to talk about young people being at risk. We now talk about the wave of people who are off radar and at risk. And it's a new phrase that's come out and it means we know that domestic violence has increased during the pandemic. So we know that more teenagers and children will be witnessing domestic violence. So we know that they are at risk because of that. We just don't know who they are. They're off our radars. So I, I do think that young people will get back onto the streets as families allow them and as they just boredom sets in and they just, you know. So I think, I, I personally feel we will see a resurgence of young people out and about. Um, somebody very rightly put in the feed on the chat, um, 
you know, young people are going to be blamed for any spikes in in uh, COVID-19 out and about. And, I, and I'm seeing that in Preston, that young people are being demonised for just being out and about and doing what young people do. They're not even smoking and drinking, they're just walking around, how dare they? So I, th I think there will be a need for the church to get a detached a theology and a practice of detached youth ministry again. I absolutely think that will be important. Um, but how, I don't know yet. There was something around the pivoting and, and that whole kind of, because actually it's so easy for people just to ping back to what's familiar, isn't it? Yeah. So how can we encourage that kind of innovation and that kind of the risk taking? Um, because sometimes when people become a little bit too uncomfortable, they, they kind of look elsewhere, don't they? So it's that kind of tension between the two. Yeah. yeah. And somebody put on it, you know, I have got a mountain of pivots ahead of me. Don't add another one. And, and I would say, I mean, I would cheekily say, this is not about adding. It's about saying, just, just define what your pivot's going to be. You know, what, what I, I think actually pivoting younger probably is the only pivot we can do, which doesn't mean that we say older people don't matter. It's absolutely not the same as saying that in any way, shape or form. Um, older people matter massively. And as you know, as a society, we're waking up as well to how, as a society, we how badly we treat older people. So in no way should the church come out of this saying, well, old people don't matter, it's just about the young. But I think it's about recognising that actually as churches, we tend to cater naturally towards older. So if we want to be extending our reach, we've got to pour energy that way I do think that planting congregations can be a good way of doing this again which isn't about separating but it's about saying we recognize that meeting the needs of these different communities within our community is a challenge so maybe coming out of this we could look to resource within our area or just within our church a new congregation a new expression of, of church in a different way that could be a great way that that comes out of this and we meet together for meals and we connect as much as we can but we're gonna we're gonna try we're gonna innovate and i think that is a word for this age like spiritual innovation prophetic imagination give things a go try them out and you will be amazed at the people that are energized by that. So Gordon Beckett, I've named him, Professor Emer Emeritus at UCAN University. He is in his 60s, at Gordon, don't know if you're listening to this. Um, he's one of the best youth workers I know. He's one of the best youth workers we have at the Minster. He, he's at the front of the line when everyone has started doing stuff with young people. He's like, I'm there. I'm there. So I think, you know, as you do this, you will be amazed who comes out of the woodwork and wants to serve um, as, you, as you pivot. <laughs> We're going to be sick of that word soon, aren't we? It's like netball, pivot, pivot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um no, it's, it's really good and you, it's, it's just sometimes it's the small degrees isn't it that you do each each time so that's that's really important um there's something around sharing faith like encouraging the peer sh of sharing faith and um, i went to this there's some research that was done with the under fives actually and they sort of talked about um the confidence of sharing faith but actually what they were saying was there's a confidence in people of inviting them to events so i don't necessarily think people are as confident about sharing faith as they are about inviting them to something so somebody else shares the faith, kind of abdicate yeah, the responsibility. Yeah. Um, what would your reflection around young people and sharing faith with peers be? Well, I think, I mean, again, it depends what we mean by sharing faith. If, if, um, if we think that sharing faith is a kind of a, a set few things that we say, then, then that will always feel quite clunky. If, if we say sharing faith is, actually, I have the risen Christ living and active by his spirit alive in my life. So anytime I engage on social media with my friends, I'm sharing Jesus because Jesus is at work in my life. So my attitude to money and plastics and Black Lives Matter and justice issues and being vegan and, and my, my, you know, how I treat my body, that's because of Jesus. So I think if we... Sort of say to young people it's a whole life discipleship living your life for Jesus in front of your friends living in such a way that makes them provoke to ask questions I mean that doesn't scripture say that live in such a way that, that um, you know your father will be glorified and, and it's tantalizing about your life so I think we do to help young people capture a bigger vision of what it means to share their faith um, we ran a, a course at Youthscape and the, um, about sharing faith online and we got Christian young adults to come and join us. And what really amazed me that, that they had a week creating these films and creating content and not one of them, and we said it's about sharing your faith online, not one of them talked about Jesus in their films, not one of them. And at the end I sat down and said to them, you guys, this was about
about sharing your faith in Jesus, not one of you have talked about Jesus. Can, you, can we just unpack that? And it was really interesting because they said, well, I didn't know how to, to talk about Jesus. And I said to one girl, well, you're, you made your film about fashion and about the fashion industry and how you feel it's so unjust that people are made to feel bad about not looking a certain way. Like, where does that injustice come from? And she said, well, it comes from the fact that I believe that, that I'm made in God's image and that Jesus loves me as I am. And I said, share that share that so i think it's about helping young people connect the, you know what difference does loving jesus make in your life how do you see things differently to your peers connect the dots so talk about that talk about the fact that you hate zoom because you have to look at your face all the time but by looking at your face all the time it makes you say jesus i don't like my face today but i know you like me and I'm going to trust what you say about me. Like that's sharing your faith, isn't it? That's sharing your faith and showing your face. So I think <laughs> it's about helping young people connect the dots. There's not a set thing to say to share your faith. There's showing the difference that Jesus makes. And I think that, and they redid their films and they were just amazing. Oh, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Like, yeah, really kind of echo that, isn't it? We, we want to be so prescriptive sometimes in what it kind of means. And we like these easy kind of, but actually... Yeah in our lives isn't it um we, we i'm going to end it there because we've only got a minute left so thank you so much rachel for doing that q a inspire connect resource growing healthy churches in relationships for god's mission